listening to the Elim Church Northampton podcast. This message was recorded live as part of our regular Sunday service. We know that this is a great investment into your life. So tune in and give it a listen. For more information, visit elimnorthampton.com. Sound guys, media, all our welcome team, everyone that's volunteering, we thank you so much for helping us do this. A big special uh, welcome to Pastor Dave Campbell. Come on, let's give him a big Northampton welcome as he comes today. And Mandy. Come on, let's thank them both for coming today. I'm sorry, but I was definitely not shinning it up the stage like Jason just did. It could be embarrassing. Thank you, um, Northampton Elam, for having us here today. It's not often I get to travel with Dave, um, so I'm sure he's been saying lots of things about me in the meeting I wasn't in. He usually, I'm usually the butt of most of his sermon illustrations, but um, Linda just invited me up to just share a little bit about my life and what I do. And I've had the absolute honour to work for Elam International Missions for the last 17 years. So if anyone's here today wondering, you know, what could I do? What could I give to God? A mission experience is absolutely amazing. It is, I know it sounds cliche, but it is life changing. And I facilitate both short-term and long-term teams, so and short-term and individual placements. So if you thought I've always liked to do a mission trip, do contact me and I can definitely arrange that for you. As well as doing that role, I also, for the last few years, have been working in the area of human exploitation, which is a challenging area and one which is such an honour to serve in. So at Elam Missions, we have a programme called Be Free, which I sort of take a lead on. And um, I'm sure you've all heard the phrase human exploitation, also called modern day slavery. And it's a, it's a tragic situation, which um, you may think it ended many years ago with the ending of the transatlantic slave trade, but it's the fastest growing illegal trade in the world. And um, there are more than 40 million people in the world caught up in human exploitation. And that is also very heavily weighted against women and children. 71% of the victims are women and children. So in my role there, I'm helping to raise funds with Elam's Be Free projects. If you want to hear any more about them as well, I'll be around at the end. But thank you for the opportunity. And I'll hand over to Dave, who talks more than me. did have to read out my sermon when I realised Mandy would be here. <laughs> I actually have to say, I'm so proud of my wife. Mandy and I, um, Mandy met me when I was, I was her pastor, and she was in Ashbourne in Derbyshire, and I, I ran off with the organist. <laughs> but you can only do it once, and you do have to get married. And so we, we, we did that, but, but we were plastering the church since almost, but like I said, we went in 1985. Uh, Mandy would never, she'd never get up on platform and say anything. Nothing. So I used to say things like, even Mother's Day, man, did you just come up and announce? We'd go, no. And I said, just, I'm the head of this house. You come up. And, and because we pl- planted the church, everyone in the church, I was their only ever pastor. I said, you come up. And, and, and they start booing me for giving her a hard time. And so I could never get to say anything or do anything. And then God touched her heart for missions and for the, the fatherless and for injustice and and, and I am so proud of her because what you saw there is someone who, who could not stand up. Every time she stood up, her, her knees had fellowship, you know, sort of they bind each other. She was just so, so nervous. And God gave her a heart for, for reaching out for, for those in the greatest need. So you, you might feel you've not got a public ministry, and that's good because, to be honest, one at a time is enough on a platform. But there's a sort of to reach in. I think you're closer to God's heart when you're reaching out to those who are in need and, and, and those that are oppressed. So, so thank you, darling. You're great. You're great. I'm going to reach... If you are under 30, I want to tell you, this is a Bible. Um, you want to try and get one of these before they run out because um, in the, the old days, we all used to bring one of these to church. But so if, if, if you're under 30, open... Switch your Bible on and go to Acts chapter 2. Because this is the day of Pentecost. This is... We're Pentecostals. That means this is our day. 
We've got a day for us. Oh, happy Pentecost Day. It says there's Acts 2 verse 1. Pastor Linda sort of read bits of it. I'm going to read a bit more of it. When the day of Pentecost had fully come, they were all with one accord in one place. I said, this is the day of Pentecost, and it's fully come, and we're, all, so we're doing well. Suddenly there came a sound from heaven, as of a rushing mighty wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. Then there appeared to them divided tongues of, as of fire, and one sat upon each of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. And they were dwelling in Jerusalem, Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven. And when this occurred, sound occurred thank you, can you tell? So, I'm not usually allowed out on my own, actually. That's why Mandy's here, she might be caring for me. Devout men from every nation to heaven. And when, when this sound occurred, the multitude came together and were confused because they heard them speak in his own language. Then they were all amazed and marveled, saying to one another, Look, are not all these who speak Galileans? And how is it that we hear each in our own language in which we were born, Parthians and Medes and Elamites? Elamites, to those who are in Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, and the rest of the United Nations. We hear them speak in our own tongues the wonderful works of God. So they were all amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, whatever could this mean? I, think, I always think that sounds really English, don't you? Whatever could this mean? Others mocking said, they're all full of wine. But Peter stood up with the eleven, raised his voice and said to them, Men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you and heed my words. For these are not drunk, as you suppose, since it's only the third hour of the day, which is nine o'clock in the morning. But this is what was spoke by the prophet Joel. And it shall come to pass in the last days, says God, that I will pour up my spirit on all flesh. Your sons and your daughters shall prophesy. Your young men shall see visions and your old men shall dream dreams. You know why old men dream dreams? Because they keep dropping off to sleep and it's so much easier for God just to give them a dream. And so <laughs> I find that. You know, if I drop off in church, somebody says, you fell asleep. I did not. I just thought God wanted to give me a dream and I was make myself available. <laughs> I'm just trying to be obedient. So. Not my men's servants and my maid servants I will pour up my spirit in these last days and they shall prophesy I will show them wonders in heaven above and signs in the earth beneath blood and fire and vapor of smoke the sun shall be turned into darkness and the moon into blood before the coming of the great and awesome day of the Lord and it shall come to pass that whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved amen God bless his word hmm. The first church was Pentecostal. In fact, I don't think there's a choice. Nowadays, people decide which church they're going to go to. Let's go to Baptist Church this week. Or should we try Methodist Church? Try, let's try that church over there. Actually, if you didn't like, if you went to this church, you didn't like it, you couldn't say, let's go to the church down the road. Because there wasn't one. There's only one. And they were Pentecostal. They're talking about the fullness of the Holy Spirit. But can you imagine going for the first time? This is the first time you've been to this meeting. And he's just sitting there quietly, or actually they would be standing there probably, because then it said they stood to pray. So everyone's standing. And the Bible says there was a sound of a rushing mighty wind. Well, first thing though, the whole place is shaking. Now, if you live in a country where there's earthquakes and there's a nurse there's a little shaking, you you do look at each other to see if anyone else is running out. Okay, we'll stay. That was weird. Okay, coincidence. And then <laughs> But nothing was blown around. It wasn't like everything was blown all across the room. So that was the sound of a rushing mighty wind, but there was not a rushing mighty wind. Like, see, nowadays we'd all look at the sound desk going, what are you doing? What's that noise about? There was no sound desk. And I was said earlier, you know, the only time people notice with PA system is when something goes wrong. The sound, so we just want to thank you for all the days nothing goes wrong and we don't notice you, so thank you for that. But this rushing mighty wind, I think, well, I'm going to ask the pastor about this. 
Uh, what's his name? Jason. Yeah, so his name up there. Pastor Jason. So Jason, what's this with the place shaking? And what was that wind noise? So you ask. You know, you sort of, you know, you try to remember things. You know, have you ever been talking to someone? They talk so much that you don't get a word in. And they say something, you say something. Like, when, you stop, when you stop, I'm going to ask you that. And you hold your finger think, when you stop for a breath, I'm going to ask that question. And then they stop for a breath. You think, now, what was I holding my finger for? And by the time you remember, they've got their breath and they're off away again. So I think, you know what? All right, but I'm going to ask about that. I'm going to ask about the wind. I'm going to ask about the... Yeah. And then you look to the person next to you. They've got a flame sticking out their head. Now, you would notice that. In England... We, we wouldn't say anything. I mean, just, <laughs> you wouldn't draw attention to it in Britain. Too. <laughs> it's, it's, it's good. Um, I'll see me old chap, but um, you're going to need to get a new hat. <laughs> it's gone. <laughs> I, wonder if, I wonder if you knew. I wonder, see, I worry about these things. How would you know if you had a hip flame sticking out your head? You. <clears throat> ah, was it, was it hot? I don't know. But you start thinking, this has never happened to me in church before. So the place is shaking. There's the sounds of winds. People got like the British gas advert with their flames sticking out of their head. <laughs> what on earth is happening? I'm going to ask. And ask. In fact, there's so many things I have to ask Pastor Linda because Pastor, Pastor Jason won't know. But ask Pastor Linda. She'll know. She'll ask her deep questions. Ask her all the hard questions. And, and, and then. Then you see someone standing, speaking, who you know. It's, you know, you went to school with them. They don't speak lots of languages. And they're, they're speaking one language, and you hear it in a different language. That's really weird. Because, most, see, I don't know if you know this, most British people don't speak lots of languages. Have you noticed that? I speak three languages. Scottish, English, and rubbish. But I think that's really strange because not only are these people speaking languages they have not learned, we're hearing it in a language that they're not saying it. Somebody, and that's not in the Bible yet. See, the, the, the wind's in the Bible, the fire's in the Bible, in the Old Testament, but speaking in tongues is definitely only in Acts 2 onwards. It's not there. Jesus mentioned it a bit in the New Testament, but it's not written yet either. I'm going to ask the pastor. So now you've gone, you've, you've actually got five hands. Thank you, there's so much to ask, but pastor will know, pastor will know. And then Peter stands up. Peter is the sort of person, he, he will give you an answer even if he didn't know one. So he stands up and this is, this is what he, he says. He said, men of Judea and all who dwell in Jerusalem, let this be known to you. And he uses these words, he said, heed my words. And that's the way... Uh, a rabbi would start his teaching a bit like um, in the olden days we used to have a program called Jack and Ori and you say are you sitting comfortably good then I'll begin or once upon a time how you start a story a, a, a rabbi would say okay we're having good, uh, good fellowship time good chatting now heed my words I've just moved from being ch chit chat into instruction so we just listen carefully what comes next is it's not just chat so you must have thought this is great He's going to talk about the shaking of, a, of, of the ground. He's going to talk about the wind. He's going to talk about people speaking in tongues and you know, flames sticking out of their head. And this is what he said. This is that which is spoke by Prophet Joel. In the it doesn't mention it. It doesn't mention the wind. It doesn't mention fire. It doesn't mention talk to me. What he says is, this is God. The first thing we need to ask ourselves when something happens is, who's doing this? If you ask that question properly, you'll be a lot more careful about the second question you ask. Because if this is God, well, this is God, so why would he be doing that? Because Jesus said, if you wait in Jerusalem until the Holy Spirit will come upon you, it will transform you and change you forever. Can I say to you, if you wait and get filled with the Holy Spirit today, your life will never be the same again. It's not meant to be the added extra, you know. Do, you know, I, I needed an advert there. There's certain airlines, when you book up for them, it's almost like, oh, that's cheap. And then they say, do you want a seat? Yeah, I'd like a seat. Okay, you pay a bit extra for a seat. But you're going to bring a bag. <laughs> you pay a bit extra for a bag as well. <laughs> so, so, do you want to use the toilet? Or do we charge you? 
They're outside toilets, but they're good. So you think, it's almost, and then suddenly the price is huge. Christianity's not like that. There's no added on extras. Everything's paid for. Everything's including the price. Everything's there. And I'm, I'm, we all going to, I have a good authority going to heaven's first class travel. But we have a problem with that we start now that we begin to make what is supposed to be quite easy going, we make it complicated. I think we can make anything complicated. Let me give you an example. You may have guessed, but I'm not actually from England. I'm from Scotland. This this is an accent. It's not an impediment. It's, It's an accent. And where I come from, everybody speaks like this. And when you go to heaven, you'll speak like this as well. Anyway, <laughs> but one of the things growing up, I've got an identical twin brother. Some of you know my uh, good-looking boy, my twin brother and I. But when we were growing up, we went to the boys' brigade. And the boys' brigade teaches some things about obedience, reverence, discipline, self-respect, all that tends the world to true Christian manliness. But one of the things it did when I was about seven or eight years old was we had, a, we had to get badges and to get this badge, we did the first aid badge. First aid badge, they gave us a little booklet. Now, when you're a certain age, you open your little, my daddy says, that's it. And then you go to school and you say, no, daddy, you're wrong, my teacher says. And then later on, you say, my books, the, the book says. So I, they gave us a book. And this book didn't just say words, it had a picture. It had a diagram. And this diagram showed you how to breathe. And I can remember thinking, even then, I thought, they've left that late, really. I mean, I'm eight. You think they tell you. And as I was looking at this book, it quite obvious it had a side view, and somebody was breathing in through their nose, it was going down into their lungs, did whatever it does in your lungs, swaps over, and then out your mouth. And it's, then it explained this how you breathe. In your nose, in your lungs, out your mouth. And I'm sitting there thinking, I don't do that. No, I definitely breathe in and out my nose. I don't breathe. And I didn't want to tell anyone. When you found out that a book's just told you there's something desperately wrong with you doing the most basic human thing. So I kept doing it properly. Praying properly. I remember going home, standing in the kitchen, my, my mother's top my mother, she's just there, I'm going. <sighs> my mother said, What are you doing? Me? I'm breathing. <laughs> I'm breathing properly. Because you never taught us how to breathe. I've just gone to Boys Brigade and they taught me how to breathe. <sighs> My mother said, stop that, you're making yourself dizzy. I said, I have. <laughs> because even breathing, you can make it so complicated, you make yourself dizzy. Babies know how to breathe. Nobody ever taught them how to breathe. And if we're not careful, we can make being filled with the Holy Spirit. It's meant to be just as easy, just as natural as breathing. We can make it complicated. You've got to say this, you've got to do it. No, you don't. Just breathe. I don't care if you breathe through your nose or your mouth. Just get full of the Holy Ghost. I'm not worried how you do it. I know where it comes from. It's not how does it happen, it's who's doing it. That's the big question. It's a sort of mad, massive question. Because we're almost a little bit worried that, you know, you don't want to get it wrong. I found in my 50 years nearly, over 50 years of ministry now, I've prayed for tens of thousands of people. And one of the things I found when people come up for prayer, there's several fears. Here's one of them. They're afraid that when they get prayed for, number one, nothing will happen. Get prayed. Have you ever get prayed for and nothing happens? Think, oh, that was nothing. How disappointing. Okay. I've been prayed for by, by people, and I thought, I, you know, I, I, th- I, I think I'm losing the anointing. The longer this goes, I think I'm losing the will to live. If you just leave me alone, and you know, yeah, sometimes you just won't be left. Like, I'm talking to the right people here. Sometimes uh, someone comes to pray for you and says, If you rub my neck once more, I will break both your arms. <laughs> that's, that's all I'm saying. That's all I'm saying. If I want a neck massage, I'd go somewhere else. Just leave me alone. 
goodness gracious, just leave me. I'm fine, I'm fine, I'm fine, fine. Where's Jesus? Come back, Holy Spirit. Just... So you don't want to get prayed for, nothing happens. Like nothing. So I'm afraid of nothing happens. The second fear, something will happen. Either nothing will happen or something. And usually something bad, like a manifest a demon or something. <laughs> Yeah, that was a joke. That's not, that was not a real demon. Question, have you got a demon? No. Well, how can you... How, we haven't got spare demons to give out to people. You don't have to bring your own. We, we, we don't cast demons in, we cast them out. So you're not going to... And if you did have one, you'd want rid of it, wouldn't you? So I don't see what the problem is. It's a, it's just, it's a, because the, the, the worry is that something bad will happen to me if I get prayed for. That's the worry. It's normal. Jesus talked in Luke chapter 11. He said, if, you, if your son asks for bread, will you give him a stone? Or if he asks for a fish, will you give him a serpent? Or if he asks for an egg, will you give him a scorpion? He said, no. If you've been evil, know how good gifts, give good gifts to your children, how much more will your heavenly Father give the Holy Spirit to those who ask him? And it's interesting the things that Jesus picks up on. He thinks on like, like, like bread. It's the basic, it's, it's basic things of life. These are bread, fish and egg is what poor people eat. It's not like you know, steak, caviar and stuff. It's not like, not like that. Because bread, give us this day our daily bread. I don't know if you like gardening. I don't particularly like gardening. I like a nice garden. So I will do gardening to get a nice garden. But I don't do garden. Some people like doing gardening just for the fun of it, don't they? If you're like that, you can drop down our house anytime you like and have a couple of hours delight and joy on your own. But one of the things I've found with gardening is when you're digging, you find these stones. I honestly, we've lived in the same house 20 odd years, 30 years. I've never planted stones. <laughs> I've never, where on earth do these things come from? I thought, but you get one out and you think, do you know, if you wash that, it would look like a it looks like a bread, little bread roll. You could stick it in a bowl and when Pastor Jason comes around and pick it up, he'd break his teeth. That'd be funny, wouldn't it? No, you wouldn't do that. We've got a bread bin in our house, but we, but we've put bread in ours. So what do, you, what, do you, what do you do with these stones? You just chuck it over the fence in the neighbor's garden, don't you? No, no, you don't, no, you don't. You bury it and say, see you next year. And it's like, um, we've, got a, we've got a fridge now and... Um, uh, on, on, when you open the door on the top, it's got little things like that. But we put, we put eggs in there. Is that right? But you see, in, in, in Jesus' time, there's a little white, even now, there's a little Middle East, there's a little white scorpion that curls itself up and it hides and it looks like an egg. So you could have said, do you want, do you want an egg? And give it to somebody. <laughs> it's, just, it's, it's a scorpion, really. And it's a great joke. But see, if my house... If I saw a scorpion running across the floor, I'd go, whose dead scorpion is that? Because I tell you, my house is a safe house. We don't have scorpions in our house. Doctor told me at one point I needed to take up a hobby, you know, to keep fit. So I bought a fish tank. I took me for a walk every morning. Walkies, whoa. No, I'm not. That sounds cruel. I didn't really do that. But, but we, haven't got any, we didn't keep any steaks. Now, somebody's bound to come up and say, yeah, we keep snakes in our house. I've got a word of knowledge for you. You don't get many visitors, do you? <laughs> because again, why? Because my house, is a, I've got six grandchildren. That's why there's going to be second offering today. <laughs> I don't have bad things like that. Listen to me. God does not have any bad gifts. You cannot receive a bad gift gift from God because his is a safe house so it's not like when we're praying for people we go fish egg bread fish scorpion sorry <laughs> snake somebody's got to have one well, we haven't got any you cannot receive Bible says every good and perfect gift comes from the father of lights I'm going to say only good and perfect gifts don't be afraid he's only got good things for you you can't you can't get anything bad. You can't get anything bad at all. 
Sometimes, have you heard too, I don't want to have just like an emotional experience, you know. Have you heard that phrase, it's faith, not feelings? You know, you've got to be careful now because you don't want to be one of these crazy Pentecostals like they were in the Bible. It's faith, not feelings. Actually, I've got to tell you, faith feels good. How do you know you're in faith? Because it's like the peace of God rule in your heart. As an umpire, that's what I says. How do you know? And here's the key thing, is your faith must not rest on your feelings. Your feelings must come from your faith. I feel forgiven because I know I'm forgiven. The faith came first. My faith is the, is, is the foundation for my emotion. And that's what percolates it up. So you're allowed to be happy. I don't say to your neighbour, I told you you could have been happy all these years and look at you, it's been a miserable so and so for. Because Jesus is looking for a bride that loves him. Can you imagine a lady get married and saying to her husband, okay, well, off you go, you go home, I'll see you, see you later. So you love me, it's all right. Jesus is looking for a bride who's passionate for him, who loves him with all her heart. And some of us who are a bit more cerebral, and I'm a bit tend to be a bit like that, we need to learn how to connect and worship and take the neural pathways that bring us into his presence and make us aware of what, when the Holy Spirit's moving in the meeting. That's just because that, that, that's who we are, because different isn't wrong. Just because you're different didn't mean you're wrong. And I, I know that... Um, one of my friends, John Arnold, and I, we, we started something, oh, 20 odd years ago, we started something called Lamppost Ministries. Because when we get prayed for, it's like the lights are on, but nobody's in. Do you know what I mean? I get prayed for. And nothing happens. And I can tell, I've actually been in meetings where hundreds are getting prayed for, and I just stand like that. And they go away, and I can see somebody else coming. I think, they don't, if I don't fall over soon, I, I, I sometimes feel, you know, when, when you get prayed for, I think, I don't, I don't do anything. Do you know what I mean? But sometimes I think I'm going to go, whoa, like that, because that would really encourage them. You know what I mean? Just to, <laughs> just to think of think. I've even had people who, I'm not sure I should go down this track, but I've started, so I've finished. Have you ever had anyone just rocked you a little bit on your ankle, on your heels? No, I don't fall over usually when I get prayed for. It's just the way it's been the last seven, 67 years. I'm not nice. I think sometimes it's because the catchers are behind me going, oh, God, no. <laughs> oi, 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 three of you, come over here. Come on. Don't fall, don't fall. They're praying, Lord, don't let them fall. You'll kill somebody. So, so, so kind of, visiting Scotsman crushes three people to death in Northampton. Not good. Not, not good. So, just, just, so I, 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 I tend not to fall. But I have had people sort of rock me on my heels. Now, I'm from Clydeside, which is near Glasgow, which is not the most posh part of Scotland. So I'm just, I'm not proud of this thing, but I was once in a meeting, but am I, and this person, well, I wouldn't say he, he prayed for me, I'd say he hit me. <laughs> and suddenly I went, hit me. Like, okay, when I come from, I know what that means. Outside. <laughs> come on. Two go out, one come back, and they went, tell you what, I'm coming back. I think it was thumping it. And I didn't know it all this in the prayer line, all these people, they're all they're all getting prayed for and they're all back in for healing. Oh that bad head, I've got a headache. <laughs> then I'll just say to you very gently, if you've ever been prayed for by someone who tried to push you over or did push you over, knocked you, can I apologize to you? I'm really sorry that happened. I'm sorry, number one, because it was wrong. And probably the person that did it didn't mean any harm. They're just a bit too enthusiastic. But the problem is, it makes it more difficult for you to receive every time you get prayed for after that. In fact, maybe you stopped getting prayed for because of that. You need to let go of that now and let God minister to you. Forgive them and let go. And if they do it again, tell them. And I'll, I'll, tell me, I'll sort them. I'll pray for them the Glasgow way. <laughs> we have to stop that. So sometimes you see people who... I see some people, I've, got, I've gone towards rows of people and they all just fell over. <laughs> what was that? I don't know what that was. I don't know. 
And then there are other people who don't receive anything. You cannot tell looking on the outside what's happening on the inside. It's a huge mistake. So when I get prayed for, people might say, not a lot is happening. But trust me, a lot has happened to this man. I am not who I used to be. I'm more full of the Holy Ghost now than I've ever been. And the same for you. So we're not, we're not trying to judge you by saying if you fall on the floor, it's better. If you don't fall on the floor, it's even better. It doesn't matter really, to be honest. What really matters was your heart opened right then. Did you receive what went straight inside? Was that a good thing that happened to you? I think sometimes too, we get this whole intimacy analysis problem where we think, you know, what, what's happened? We want, to, we want God to touch us. We want to sense his presence. We want to know it. But I'm a bit of an analysis sort of person. I mean, on the fly, I'm quite intellectual. You know, I, I, I do study things a lot. I, I read books with words that are in, in, in Greek that don't give you ling- English for. I, I do that sort of stuff. So I quite like it. But I think one of the signs of being a good Bible scholar is you can make it, translate it into English to talk to people about it. So I, I, do, I, I, I like all that. I like all that. And so often I, I am not careful. I can analyse what's happening. I like watching people. I'm off the platform. I'm more of an introvert than an extrovert. On the platform, people think I'm an extrovert. I'm not. I'm, I'd rather sit quietly and talk to Jason. Jason and I are a bit similar. So I'd rather just chat quietly and let the wives talk. And we, well, that's, just the, that's just the way we are. So, but, so, so we're different. Very, very different. But there are times we have to realise... This is not time, David, to analyse. It's a time to receive. It's a time for intimacy. I'll give an example. Let's say Mandy and I are married 43 years now. There you go. I'll say this. It's Mandy deserves the applause for that. And yes, she got a good one. That's the thing. She did well there. She did really well there. But just thinking, but you know, we still. Our children are up and grown now. We've got six grandchildren, our daughters, you know. The, but I think our children are the age we think we are, if that makes sense. But some ever so often, we have a night in, just the two of us. Hardly ever happens. And we have a, I won't, I won't give any secrets away. And we're just sitting there, have a night in, just the two, nobody else there. Nice Chinese takeaway. Watch Taggart on TV. Because I know how to show a woman a good time, you know. <laughs> I have that brave heart, something like that. And there comes that point in the evening when it's just, you know, your eyes catch. There's that little glimpse. It's life. And we just sort of move towards each other. Mm. Just as our lips are about to touch, I say to Mandy, Mandy, do you know there's more germs in the human mouth than almost any other part of your body? <laughs> no, that's true. If we could teach teenagers that, we wouldn't have half the problems we've got. It's disgusting, the amount of germs. But, but so it's factual. You can analyse it. How I many of you know it could spoil the moment? Yeah, I could spell them on for quite a long time, to be honest with you. But, no, it's, but why? Because it's not a time for analysis. It's a time for intimacy. It's a time for being alone and enjoying one another's company. But that doesn't mean we say, therefore, when you come to church, everything goes. Everything we say is because even from that point, we've done a little bit of pre-analysis. Number one, for example... This is my house. But in our own house. We're not run visiting the neighbours. You know, not suddenly having a romantic time and somebody else said, No, this is our house. Number two, this is my wife I'm going to kiss. That's quite an important factor to get right, really. <laughs> you start kissing other people's wives or husbands, that's really not on. We don't like we don't like that. So it's my house and it's my wife. And thirdly, it's an appropriate moment. It's not in the middle of the Elders meeting or something. <laughs> it's my house, it's my wife, in the appropriate moment. Can I just say to you, this is his house. We, we are his bride. And this is an appropriate moment. And he's only got good gifts. We have nothing to fear. 
and he wants to impart that to us. Let me finish by just saying there's ways in which he imparts that to us and how we receive. Because it's not meant to be difficult. All the important things in life are simple. Like street signs. If you go up to a street sign, there's a big one that says stop. It just says stop. It doesn't say please lower your gear, please you know, sort of, uh, look your rear mirror. It just says stop. And the things that are important when we feel the Spirit are not, he makes it so, so you have to become like a child to take it in. Some, some things Jesus says, you'll have to just stop being grown up for a minute and just pretend you're a child. Because when I say receive, I just mean receive. That's all I mean. I don't mean do this, 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 and this. That's just mean for you to receive. You have to re- learn how to receive that and take that. Some ways in the Bible where people received the Holy Spirit was once when Jesus prayed for his disciples, the Bible says he, he breathed on people. Do you ever think what that looked like? He went, <sighs> Now, I know from reading that fish and garlic was a major part of the diet in Galilee. <sighs> so I think maybe if we, people started falling over when they get prayed for, it was because of garlic and, and fish. So maybe that was it. So thinking, thank you for that. Oh, thank you, Jesus. That's lovely. <laughs> there is, I don't know if I should do this. I don't know how religious your church is, but, but, uh, but it's in the Bible. There's, there's one way that when Jesus prayed, well, one thing that Jesus did, I do not do. Well, not intentionally anyway. Maybe by accident a little bit. But, but the pastor will do it for you if you really need it. Jesus spat on people. Now, I don't know if you ever read the Bible and it says there's a time when he went to a blind man. The thing about blind people is they can't see. That's, so he's got Jesus standing in front of him. So he can't see. All he hears is Jesus standing in front of him going, He's going, oh, no, oh, no, no, no. And then he hears, oh, for goodness sake. For a minute, I thought he was going to put, in my eyes. Because what happened was Jesus spat in the ground and he made so much spit, he made some mud. And he picked it up and slapped it on a man's face and his eyes. And then he said to him, go and wash. If ever any of the commandments was easy to obey, that was the easiest commandment in the whole Bible. <laughs> wash, yeah, I'll wash, I'll wash. And he was healed. He was, but we don't do that. I mean, maybe by accident a bit might come out when you're speaking, but you don't mean, really mean it. So, so Jesus spat on people. He also had, um, in the New Testament, he had anointed cloths. I don't know what you think about that. I remember when somebody came to our church and on Sunday night service, I don't know who the woman was, once or twice, and said, um, my grandchild's very ill in Great Ormond Street Hospital. Would you pray for this handkerchief? I can go take it and put it on the baby. Can I just be honest with you? Because, I mean, I'm not sure what I thought about it. I thought, oh, that sounds what... People send you cloths and say, if you send us $1,000, I'll send you a bit of cloth. And so I was, I was a bit... Put, Honestly, there's just I'm trying to process something. I'm not I'm not sure. I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not, I know it's in the Bible, but okay. When she got the hanky out, it wasn't a handkerchief. It was a, from the box of tissues we had over there. It was a Kleenex. I thought you could at least have got a cloth one. I said, come on, give me a kiss, MDC. And I prayed for this hanky. So I went away. I can't remember it that week and the week after. Um, again, on a Sunday night meeting, this lady came and gave a testimony. And she said, um, the other week there, a young man. I thought, oh, that was me. <laughs> that was a while ago. <laughs> hey, and he, he prayed. And I said, well, don't, don't, tell him it's a, don't tell him it's a tissue, please. She said, I don't even have a proper hanky. I just said, it's one of those Kleenexes. I thought she's told her it's Kleenexes. That's fine. She said, and I, I went straight from there down to the hospital to pray for my grandson. And when I got there, they wouldn't, they wouldn't let me put the Kleenex on top of the baby. Um, it was in a... Pretty caught. Inky beard, that's it. And she said, I can put it on top. She said, no, you're not allowed to do it. I can put it under his pillow. No, he's not got a pillow. She says, I'll put it on the floor. Underneath. And I knew it. She says, I've got a long story short. Two days later, he was sent home, totally healed. 
I thought, wow. Anyone else got angry? Bring them forward, bring them pray. I'm not, I'm not so I don't, I'm still not sure what I think about it, but it works in the Bible. There's another one which I don't do that much either. It says about the Bible when Peter shadow fell on people. <laughs> I think I could get a whole family behind one of my shadows. Bring a bring a granny, bring everybody, everybody get in there. I think I could get a whole family. If I, I think if I stood in the right position, I could get a small village and in under my shadow. But Peter did that. Another time. Jesus said, the Bible says he spoke his word and he healed them. He sent forth his word and he healed them. Sometimes didn't even have to go there. Just had to speak and uh, speak the word and he healed. Because it seems as if to me God will find any way possible just to facilitate filling his own people. But the way which he did more than often than ever, and that's why we probably be doing church, is, we, is they laid hands on people. In the Old Testament, they laid hands on the patriarchs, laid hands on like Joseph and all his brothers. The high priest would lay his hands on the sacrifices. Jesus laid hands on on little children and blessed them. Paul and Barnabas were set aside for the gospel, been laying on of hands. And then we're told to pray for the sick by the laying on of hands. That's why we pray for people. That's why we lay hands on people. It's not to stop them running away. It's, it's, it's to sort of identify with them because there's something happens. There's nothing magical in our hands, but there's something supernatural in the acts that we're doing that brings his presence. So let me pull this together and just say to you, wouldn't it be wonderful today if all of us got a new infilling of the Holy Spirit? If all of us just asked, because this isn't the heart. This isn't something you have to qualify for. This isn't something that you earn. This is something that's already paid for. This is something that's given to you. And if you think, you know, I'm not a good enough Christian, could I just say to you, that's why you need him. Because I'm not either. Without the anointing of the Holy Spirit, I'm not even a very good after dinner speaker. I've tried it. I'm not very good at it. In fact, most things I'm not very good at. Without the anointing, that's what makes us different. No one can live the Christian life in their own strength. But everyone can live it. See, I can do all things through Christ who gives me strength. On your own, nobody can do it. With him, all of us can do it. All of us can do everything. So in the moment, I'm going to suggest we're going to stand. And I'm going to ask God, if you're able to stand, the stand is difficult for you, don't do it. But, or, or sometimes you feel as if, as if you just want to stay where you are. Do you know what I mean? Sometimes, I feel God's touching me. Well, stay where you are. Because the most important thing I'd like to do now is to pray over you all and just ask the Holy Spirit to come fill us. And it may be that you've, you might speak in tongues for the first time today. It might be something you've never done before. And speaking in tongues is an interesting thing because the Holy Spirit doesn't speak in tongues. He gives us the words to speak in tongues. We do the speaking in tongues because he knows what it means. One of, the, one of the signs of speaking in tongues is it's a language you don't know. Because if you speak a language you do know, then you're not speaking in tongues, are you? You're speaking some other earthly language and God wants you to speak it. I've tried thinking in tongues. It doesn't work. I'll give you one example. I used to go swimming. I just got up and down to do lengths. Just, it's really boring. It's, it's, and so I thought, I'll just speak in tongues. I nearly drowned. I was shaking. I can't be doing that. So, so I thought, I'll just, I'll just think in tongues. But after a while, you run out. It just, you can't think in tongues for long. Because sometimes you think it's in your, but that's why when people say, I'm worried I'm making it up. I've got to tell you, it's really hard to make it up really hard so okay on you go then do it for five minutes just just make up a language and keep going for five minutes and 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 fool yourself you can't do it it's really hard it's easier to speak in tongues than it is to pretend to speak in tongues some of you all this fear but, but if god wants you to do it what happens is the holy spirit gives you words and you just begin to speak it out and actually think i don't recognize that as a word oh that's how you recognize it because it's the words that you don't understand you just begin to speak it out. There's no prizes. You know, some people think, you know, there's an exam at the end of the week. It's not like that. 
It's an overflow of the Holy Spirit. It's connecting you with your supernatural God on a daily basis. It's what he loves to do. The Apostle Paul says, I speak in tongues more than any man. And he was not bad. He was a good Christian. But he really needed it. And we need to do it. In fact, Paul says that when you speak in tongues, you charge yourself up. It's, it's almost like it just does something for you, cleanses you on the inside and, and gets you ready to go. So, so it's almost like this is most, more important than, than your breakfast. This is, this is just keeping you going. There's times when you're worried and you, you haven't got the English and God gives you tongues to, to speak in. And it's for you. It's for you. You don't have to apply for it. You just receive it. When the day of Pentecost was fully come, they were all together in one accord and the Holy Spirit fell. The day of Pentecost has fully come. We're here together in one accord and he's going to fall. Come on, let's stand up if you're able to stand up with me. Maybe the music team come back. And... Oh, you're there. Look at that. Can't teach you then. You're right there. Let's just get comfortable. Like I say, this is, this is uh, you should leave this building feeling better than you came in. Because he wants to fill you with his presence. So, Father, I pray, just as you where you are, if, if you've never been felt, or not aware that you've been felt with the Holy Spirit before, then just begin to raise your hands and say, Lord, would you fill me? Just so, could we prayed, we said, Jesus, come into my heart, come into my life, and we became a Christian. That's all we did. I'm just going to pray a similar prayer. Please fill me to overflowing Holy Spirit. I pray, Holy Spirit, you come. Fill every believer in this place. Everyone to overflow. Maybe it's been years since you were filled with the Holy Spirit. But was, every day you ask for bread. Every day you ask for an egg. Every day you ask for fish. This is a daily experience. You can't just ask for one day and say, please do it for me every day of my life. This is a daily experience. And Jesus said, if you've been evil, know how to give good gifts to your children. How much more? But your heavenly Father, give the Holy Spirit to those that ask him. Ask him. Father, would you fill me with the Holy Spirit? Father, would you release heavenly language amongst us? Would you release that anointing? Fill me to overflow. And you'll never be empty again. Jesus said, out of your belly, will flow rivers of living water. Let the living waters flow. Let it flow from me. And as you be very quietly, if you can already, if God's already given you a heavenly language, I like you to speak in tongues quietly. Just just speak to yourself in Psalms, hymn, spiritual song. Speak in tongues. Don't whisper in tongues and don't shout in tongues. Just speak in tongues. Just speak in tongues quietly. Just enough for you to hear yourself. Just to declare, I'm full of the Holy Ghost. I receive the heavenly gift. I receive, come fill me, Father. Father, I, 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 I have good days of being a Christian, days when I wish you'd help me more. But every day you can fill me with your spirit. Every day. If you've never spoken tongues before, just get ready because here comes the words now. Just, just have a go. Nobody's, nobody's judging you. It's just for you. This is for you. It might happen right now. It might happen on the way home. It might happen, but it will happen because he gives. How much more will you have in the Father give the Holy Spirit to those that ask? He will do this. Jesus said he'll do it. If we've been evil now to give good gifts to our children, what with this good Heavenly Father? Be filled. Be filled. Be filled. Receive the Holy Spirit. Oh Lord, fill us to overflowing. Thank you, Jesus. Thank you for coming into my life. Thank you for forgiving me my sins. Thank you, Lord, for, for wiping clear the record that was against me. Now, Holy Spirit, Heavenly Dove, come fill every one of your children. We want to be Pentecostals. We want to have the experience of Pentecost, being filled with your Spirit.